This is Mouth Media Network, the business of being heard. Hi, I'm Jessica Quick, co-founder at Buzz Beauty, a sales and marketing firm for beauty brands. And what I love about beauty is the number one industry putting women into business between skin therapists, hairstylists, nail professionals, brand owners and founders, more women are able to start businesses and run them. And the beauty industry gives us that opportunity. Hi, I'm Denise Dente, the co-founder of Buzz Beauty and co-author of Whip Fire Money, an international guidebook for beauty brands looking to go global. And what I love about beauty is the journey. The journey that I've taken and have taken with other people all around the world, it's been amazing to meet people from all over the world, travel. I can't think of a better business than the beauty business to connect with people and change the lives of people and consumers. From New York City, you're listening to Beauty Is Your Business, covering the intersection of innovation and business in the beauty industry. So welcome to Beauty Is Your Business. Jessica, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be part of this. And Denise, we're thrilled to have you as well. Couldn't be more excited to be here with you all. And I'm April Franzino here with my amazing co-host, Abby Wallach. Hi, April. Hi, ladies. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Abby. I'm so excited to get into this chat and learn more about what you both do. So you have a pretty unique business. And so tell us a little bit about how you got into beauty in general and then got to where you are with what you're doing for women across you know, the world and expanding their businesses. So this is Jessica. I've been very fortunate to have jumped into this business really wanting to help out, uh, originally wanting to go into the Peace Corps and put my resume up on a job board and Dermalogica contacted me and I did some homework and realized that this industry has more women entrepreneurs than any other and I jumped at the opportunity to join that team and expand into over 100 countries with Dermalogica and work around the globe. I got to meet amazing women that were skin therapists using the product and providing financial financial assistance for their families. So it's it's been an amazing journey through that uh, process and uh, and then continuing to meet new entrepreneurs and innovate new product. It's a it's an amazing, amazing track that that I've been fortunate to be on. Wow. That is really, really, I, I feel like that's such a great way to get into the business, especially getting to travel and, you know, see what it's like in all different markets, which is really cool. And what about you, Denise? I actually started because my stepsister was a hairdresser and super impressed that every time she came to the house, everybody in the neighborhood wanted to come over and visit and get their hair cut. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. So started to look into that and fell in love with the beauty industry as a whole and did a lot of interviewing of companies that I wanted to work with. And they all said, you know, go to beauty school. This is many years ago. Start in beauty school and then go and get your education. So I actually did both simultaneously and ended up working at a brand called Sebastian in the hair care business and transferred from the hair care business and traveling the world um, very early in my career to working with a brand out of Italy and then um, working again back in the U.S. and really enjoying the travel, working with business entrepreneurs and helping them grow and achieve their individual dreams. So from big brands to small brands, it's just been such a journey. So what made you, how did you come to start your own, you know, venture and you saw this need in the marketplace? How did that come to be? Well, from the beginning, what we saw was a need that entrepreneurs are busy and they can't do it all and they can't be an expert in every field. It's exhausting to have a brand, start a brand, and so forth. And what we really wanted to do was be that set of hands and that 
guide, if you will, that will come along and help guide an entrepreneur through the obstacles of commercialization and to help grow and expand their brand globally. So it was really out of that helping hands and wanting to use our experience and expertise. And we just love entrepreneurs. So it's super exciting. Denise, Denise and I really had an opportunity to work really close together. And so when we kind of, again, sat in an airport lounge and thought about what, what do we want to do in the next chapters of our lives? And we wanted to work together and we wanted to take that knowledge and experience we had from the big beauty side, kind of the legacy brands, as well as the entrepreneur brands, and really go back out into the world and share that. And, and like Denise said, be that extra set of hands, be that guide where they can pick up the phone and call us, or we can get projects done. But our whole piece here was getting up and being able to work alongside people growing their business. And that has been such an amazing part of all of this and, and so rewarding. That's such an interesting, um, journey that you've both had. So I'm curious to know when you start working with new indie brands or entrepreneurs who are building, um, a business, what do you, can you share a little bit more about what it looks like and how you take them from being small and indie to moving into commercialization? What does that look like for you as an, I guess, an outsource, um, uh, talent community to help them, to help the entrepreneur move forward to that next level? So our goal here was really knowing that many entrepreneurs are in different stages of their growth, being able to be flexible enough to offer them either a whole package and say, look, we can help with your full marketing, or we can come in and just do bits and pieces and so for us, it's the first thing we always like to do is we like to call it a discovery, a discovery call, which usually turns into discovery weeks of working alongside them and understanding who they are and how they tick and their businesses and what they really want out of them. Because again, most people that start these amazing companies and brands and products have come from a very big why. And we want to make sure that we're getting that into the market and then really what their long-term plan is with it. And so we start there. It's a discovery call. It's really getting to know them and understanding them. And then from there, we just little by little, we don't, you know, we don't believe there's a one size fits all. And so we little by little put in front of them to what next step that we would consider doing and what recommendations we may have. And that way they're able to grow at the pace they want or need, and also decide what is the right path and seeing kind of what's in front of them, what the pitfalls may be and how to avoid them, but also that there's lots of opportunities that they maybe haven't thought about and they're not as big and scary and hairy as it may seem. So I just have a question. When you share that, are you talking about specifically in marketing or are you f talking about the full aspect of the business from everything from back-end production and manufacturing on a global scale to, you know, distribution to all of the pieces that go into, because if you, can you share a little bit more about what that looks like so our audience can understand what you're offering? I know one size doesn't fit all and everybody needs different expertise and different help at various moments of their business, but I'm just a little more curious to know what does it look like from your point of view? What types of services do you offer? We really have four major areas that we cover. Uh, the first is this marketing and creative services piece, and that covers a lot of different areas. So marketing, creative services, then we have product development. So if a brand is looking for some additional assistance from a product development standpoint, Either they're looking for a lab or they're looking for uh, packaging, labeling, um, POP, anything like that we have uh, resources for from a product development standpoint. We offer global expansion. So many brands are looking to expand outside their home market. So global expansion. And then we also have the ability to sell and help distribute product. So those are really the four key areas that we work with brands on. Obviously, part of what you do is help brands expand into international markets. So 
is that what are the biggest challenges that you think that brands have when it comes to to doing so? Denise and I's background is definitely in the international area, and that's where we do really love to focus is helping these brands move into a different market. And some of the big challenges, the first question we always get is, are we ready? How do we know that we're ready? And so from our uh, point of view, we really want to make sure that brands, they already do have a footprint in their local market. So they've already started to sell in If it's in the U.S., they've already started in the U.S., they've got sales happening, and they've already overcome some challenges. So when they start to look international, they know as much about their brand as possible and and really who that customer is that they're looking for. So one of the first challenges we always start with is, are you do you have a footprint in your home market and are you comfortable? And then do you have the resources to go international, which surprisingly aren't a lot nowadays, thanks to D2C and other mechanisms. So they can actually expand internationally pretty quickly, but it's, are you ready? And then the next thing is choosing the right markets. Where you, where you go next is, is really important for building the success. There's the two parts of getting into the market and being able to sell in the market and getting the product there <laughs> is always a hurdle from regulatory, legal, compliance. And then, so after you get it there, then how do you sell it there? So we really see it as these two parts, getting it there and selling it there. Yeah, no, it's a huge, huge undertaking. I I actually know specifically what you're talking about. I'm curious, um, do you, when you're looking at a small brand or a mid-tier brand and you're starting to think about the future and the scalability, are you looking at the global footprint from a retail, from an omni-channel point of view? I'm sure every brand is unique and every business is unique and every founder is unique, but just in terms of because the opportunity to be global from a dot-com is different than the opportunity from being global in store and on the ground. What what is what are you seeing and what does that look like? Because it's a very different conversation to be had for, you know, and for founders to really understand that, I would think it's really important. Yeah, distribution in general is a great conversation. And distribution globally, it may look different in each country for brands. So brands may choose to do a D2C path. They simultaneously may be also doing a B2B path. They may be going after specialty retailers. They may be going after the salon business. So I think one of the things that we do when we do kind of an intake is understand the brand, who the audience is, and then globally, where does that audience shop? So in one country or one region, they may shop differently, but it's the same audience. So really navigating through that, we use the word navigating a lot because you really are carving a path, creating a plan and a strategy by region or by country because there is no one size fits all. And we do, we've We've got a large network um, within our contacts and networks and what we've built over the, gosh, last 15 plus years that we do offer really those connections into whether it's B2B or into salon channel or into retail. And and like Denise said, navigating through those. So when they do decide, look, I do want to go retail, then we do absolutely help set up those contacts, meetings, and however it's going to be most successful for them and with the resources that they have available. Have you taken a look at StoryDot yet? Every brand and every product has a story to tell, and you can't successfully sell that brand or product without telling the story. StoryDot delivers your story wherever you want it to be heard. You can meet your customers at each point in their journey, connecting the dots between your business and the consumer to enhance engagement, experience, and conversion. I encourage you to take a look at StoryDot at storydot.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-D-O-T dot com. (laughs) 
what is the process like for identifying the best markets for a brand to start in? As you mentioned, that's one of the trickiest parts is figuring out, you know, where to, where to start. This is Denise's favorite question. So I'm (laughs) going to let her answer. (laughs) It really is. The, where do you start is always um, a, a place of discovery. Everybody will come from a different point of view. Oh, start in the brick markets because they have the biggest population. Somebody else will say, oh, start in a market that is most like your own. Everybody has a different point of view. Uh, Maybe they have connections in a particular market, and that's where they choose to start. So what we do is really sit down with owner founders and level set Tell us about your brand. Let's really figure out where we want to go next. And general piece of advice is start in the markets that are most like your own and where you have been the most successful. So if they've been in the U.S. and they've been successful in the U.S. with English language and so forth, chances are they may do very well in markets like Australia, New Zealand, U.K., Um, Other brands may have a particular bend to their brand focus and do very, very well in a place like Germany or France. Um, I think of it like, uh, who was it? David Hasselhoff, who David Hasselhoff played, you know, years ago, really, really well in Germany, even more so than he did here in the USA. So you, you really do have to kind of pick and choose where your brand is going to go based on a strategy and a plan. You know, it's so interesting because, so I've been in the beauty industry for many, many years. So I know from experts and and brand owners how things can evolve over time. And all of a sudden, you'll see that you have this major business in Russia, right? And you don't even know how it got there. And you're like a celebrity there. So sometimes, you know, I I know you make the plans, but I don't know, for me, like the plans don't always work out as you plan, right? But it's interesting today, and I would think with the data, right? It's like follow the numbers, follow the analytics, follow the data. There's so much data that you can collect and leverage for these businesses. I'd love to learn a little bit more about the back end and the dot-com D2C um, plans and programs, because that, you know, it's really being dictated in so many ways because retail has changed so dramatically. How are you, how are you leveraging that for your clients? And, um, as the world moves forward and, you know, it's all about it. Well, it has been about D2C for a little while. Yes. Hopefully we'll be back in the store soon, but, but reality is, you know, Commerce, e-commerce is big and where it's only going to get bigger. So for replenishment and all those things. So what does that look like for you and as you're guiding your clients? Yeah. uh, And funny enough, we actually are seeing some good indications that retail is coming back. So we are also excited about where brands are investing in retail. So we're we're with you with the retail side. From a D2C side, Everything starts with, like you were mentioning, the data and really doing the homework on the market. Before you ever go any farther, you can, from your own desk, gather a lot. There's really great resources out there, free and paid for, Um, but really gathering all of the data to get an idea of the market. From that point, once you have, we call it kind of the homework, the desk research done, honestly, D2C, retail, salon, channel, the next best thing is to get into the market. And even those, and I know D2C seems so easy, we're going to pop up a website and we'll be able to start selling. Even before that, we do do strongly recommend people get into the market and see it for themselves because local consumer tastes do matter. And you, your consumer in your home country may look and, and shop a certain way, as Denise mentioned, in another market, they may look a little different or shop a little different and how you want to talk about your brand towards them, it may shift slightly. And that flexibility in D2C especially is paramount. Um, Obviously you're dealing with different languages, different government regulations on how you can sell the product and so on. So where, where we come from at Buzz is we wanna make sure that we start on the right foot as we move into a D2C environment and that we are following 
whatever the requirements are by website, privacy, language, all of those things we start. And so for us, it's layers. We, we start, you know, with the kind of basic piece of absolutely who's the customer and how do we know that they're the right ones? How big is that marketplace for us and the opportunity? All that's do, you know, quick research. And then ideally, if they can get out into the market and see themselves, awesome. COVID has obviously affected that a bit, but now hopefully we're back in, you know, being able to travel again soon. And then from there, what are we going to build out for D2C? And there are lots of economies of scale that they can take advantage of if they're already D2C, but there are going to be some changes they need to make. And that is because of the consumer and governments. You know, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking more about the... um... Amazon.com, you know, the marketplaces, right? The marketplace is so important today. And from your point of view, you know, how do you guide? Because the marketplace is tricky, right? There is where you're uploading it and doing all the work yourself and doing all your analytics. And then there's the ones when you're bringing in uh, teams. How are you guiding people? Because if you really don't know anything about the business, so to speak, it could really, it could be very... um, unpredictable and it can be very challenging. Definitely. And we hear you about this opportunistic piece that sometimes something pops up and it's opportunistic. Someone to your point in Russia decides they want to distribute your product and you get that phone call and you get super excited and you say, Oh, you love my product. You, you love what I created. Sure. Take my, take my brand. And that is always something that we take a pause and we say, let's analyze that and let's look at it before we just say yes, because setting up your distribution, whether it's through Amazon, whether it's through a distributor, whether it's through a retail partner, rather than just purely taking the opportunistic approach of saying yes to the inbound inquiries balancing that out with what is the size of the opportunity? How are they going to represent my brand? What are the tools, resources, and budget I am going to need to support that channel properly? And so you mentioned this Amazon piece. That is a part where, again, many times an entrepreneur, particularly those just starting out, say, I'm going to build a brand and I'm going to put it on Amazon. And that is can sound much easier than it is to do well. Because what we want to do is really execute with excellence, which means you may need access to experts across a variety of of pieces. You may need somebody to help with the advertising piece. You may need somebody to help with the logistics and third party because how that product arrives to that customer may depend on whether they make a repurchase. And we know that sell to versus sell through is important. We've got to turn those bottles and get consumption of product and get brand believers. And all of that matters in each of these channels. So can you give us a little bit of an idea of how you do your research to figure out how to, what to recommend for your clients, whether it's countries to move into retail channels whatever they're looking for and whatever you can assist them with. How do you go about doing that? Where is your, you know, what's your secret sauce? If you could tell us a little bit about that. So some is just pure experience. It's just having the years of doing it and the the feet on the street globally and knowing those markets. Also just staying in touch and having a network of people that if we want to know what's happening in France, even though that we even though we can't travel right now, so to speak, we can pick up the phone and within a matter of hours, depending on the time of day, we can get answers. So there's the personal experience and knowledge. There's having a network of people and resources in the market that can tell you. And then there's also the data that's available. Um, through obviously very great third parties. But what we do find with the data sometimes, if it is on a report, it can actually be lagging. It may not be as timely as picking up that phone and or talking to some local sources that are experiencing it, even taking their phones and taking pictures and so forth. So it really is kind of those chunks of experience, local network, and then real 
strong statistical data from third party agencies. I would be remiss not to ask a little bit about your book, obviously, which probably delves into a lot of this in detail. Um, how did that come about? You know, what are you sharing uh, insider information about what you guys do in in the book? This is our favorite um, favorite question and topic because honestly, when we were on the road together for so many years and moving into markets and working with them in sales and marketing, we were told all the time, you guys need to write all this down. You have so much knowledge or you have funny things that happen, right? All of us that have traveled a bit, we you have things you just, it, they're hilarious and you would love to share them. So we took the opportunity to, to put it all into a book and that way we do have one resource where, again, working with owners, founders, maybe they're not ready yet for a full-fledged expert to help them, but they do want the knowledge and information so we sat down and started putting into the book all the things we wish we had when we had our first international trips for beauty brands, for the companies that we were building. And it started really in airports, in taxi cabs, at Italian bars. We seem to find ourselves there a lot. Um, and, and really just finding a way to get all that knowledge out to people, but in a very, uh, not theoretical way, but in a very... Uh, tangible way that they can use. And we specifically wrote the book in a way that you don't have to read it cover to cover. You can go to the exact chapter you want today. Gosh, you just got a piece of artwork and you have no idea if that is going to work in the EU. And so you go to the chapter called Compliance, Legal and Regulatory, and you can go find those answers about the question you may have because everything is done question and answer in call outs or quick notes, just again, to keep in mind that the person that's going to pick this up is going to want to find their information quickly. And that's how we, we really wanted to structure it. And, um, and for us, it's how we think, honestly, it's, we don't have time to go through what market I should be. in. I just need to know, gosh, I can't get this product out of the airport. How the heck do I clear customs with this? And so you can go directly to that section. So for Whipfire Money, that was the whole the whole um, startup of it was getting our knowledge out there. That's a great name. Yeah, I like that name. <laughs> Say that again. It. Whip, 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 fire, money. Money. That's it. Whip the three money. tools. And, the three tools. And where'd need. that name come from? Yeah, where'd that name come from? I like it. Yeah, there's there's definitely a story that should be told probably at a deeper level, but it is the three things that you will need to do business successfully internationally is whip, fire, and money. And we talk about it, and it's very true. And there, that's how we structured the book was at times we tell you, look, in this situation, um, fire is the best thing, the best tool you can use here. You're going to have to fire people up. You're going to have to get them motivated to do what you need them to do in order to get the job done. In other cases, after you've tried everything else, in some cases, you may have to spend money. The easiest, fastest, and maybe least expensive way to achieve something might be to put some money behind it. So throughout the book, we definitely talk about if you find yourself in this situation, try this tool, whip fire money, and give it a try. So, yeah. Love that. Very cool. I like that. That's, <laughs> That's great. That's so much fun. Thank you. So I think we're going to take a minute now and hit the pan with both of you, Jessica and Denise, and get to know you a little bit more on a personal level. Every business has at least one big pivotal moment. The moment when you say, okay, we're at this turning point, so then what? I'm Lahari Neil Peretti, founder of LN Accounting Advisor. I hope you'll join me each week on my podcast, Then What? As we talk with successful business leaders who push past their business's biggest then what moments and succeed in an even bigger way because of effective leadership and solid business practices. It's inspiring and deeply useful information for any entrepreneur. Subscribe to Then What on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find the best podcasts. And now... 
It's hitting the pan. We are going to take a spin of the proverbial salon chair and we will each ask you a question. So I'm going to spin the chair and the first question goes to Abby. So Denise, um, tell us a little bit about what your, well, I'm thinking about that whip fire money. Give me a situation, sorry, where you were maybe on a personal vacation somewhere internationally and you had to like get your whip fire money armor on. <laughs> Oh, personally, I definitely like to travel internationally a lot. I definitely like to spend much of my time in Western Europe, and Italy is by far my favorite country. So in that situation, I, I usually resort to money, which may or may not be uh, the choice my husband would like to choose or the tool my <laughs> husband would like me to use. <laughs> but I, I definitely find that when I travel, I really enjoy embracing the culture of, uh, of a country. And I absolutely love Italy. And I love the food and the wine and the hotels and the culture. So I get very little sleep when I travel. I will definitely use my tool of money to get me around the country as efficiently as possible. Because that is part of it is you've got to get around efficiently. And so planes, trains, and automobiles. Love that. And what about you, Jessica? Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. That's all of us. <laughs> well, I can tell you on our honeymoon, my husband and I went to South America and we uh, planned most of it. But again, traveling a lot, you just kind of learn you have to be flexible and you wing enough of it. And so we were getting off a boat and needed to get from the port of Valparaiso in Chile over into Santiago. And we, for the life of us, couldn't get a taxi or a car. And so my husband, being an engineer, was very, you know, we're going to analytically figure a way out. And um, I just kept berating people. I used my whip and I just kept... <laughs> harassing people and talking to people and um and just eventually one of the taxi drivers finally agreed to take us and <laughs> he turned out to be lovely and fantastic but my husband stood there thinking no one is going to say yes to you you're not going to get us all the way into Santiago and I said yes I will just you wait <laughs> so absolutely um again knowing kind of where you are and what tools you have available and um and how to go about using them but they will they will get you far whip fire money Love that. So we'll take another spin of the salon chair and it lands on me. So this is sort of personal and then also related to the industry, but I would be remiss to ask since you both have worked with so many brands, um, what is your desert island beauty product? So if your international travels brought you to a desert island, what thing would you want to have with you no matter what and why? Thing meaning beauty product. <laughs> so I have to tell you, um, as a new mom, I absolutely love the Becca highlighter. And when they said they were closing, I was obviously like most people just so sad because that would absolutely be my desert island product. Um, I give it even with friends now that have babies, everyone's showing up with their diapers. I'm showing up with my list of what has gotten me through and it's the Becca highlighter and a few other key products, but that one I would take with me to a desert island and now I think I need a bag of it. So Yeah, you'll have to stock <laughs> up while you can. Love that. Absolutely. What about you, Denise? Yeah, for me, a desert island would definitely be some type of lip product. And I'm a lip junkie. So um, lip gloss, lipstick, lip pencil, uh, lip conditioner, lip scrub. I definitely would not want my lips to be dry and dehydrated. Me yeah, either. Don't that... forget the sunscreen. And the... Yeah, you might <laughs> want to put some lip sunscreen in there too. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. Sure. right. Yes, I, I can't live without a good bomb either. <laughs> so, well, this has been such an amazing chat. We really appreciate it. Um, and I was just, I would love to hear any final thoughts that you both have to leave, to leave us with for today. I would say my final thought would be that 
I know so many of us now with the world starting to turn back on are getting excited to get back out there. And so if over the last year you have a brand or you're working on a brand and thought about you know, what the international path could look like, I would say jump on it now. Start getting excited because there's so much opportunity outside of home markets and we want brands to to be available to more consumers, to be available in more countries and uh, and really experience that growth and excitement and just the fun parts of working with different cultures and consumers and their wants and needs and their DMs are hilarious. So we, we want anyone out there to go out and enjoy this international arena with your brand and find a way to, to really expand. And um, there's some really great things out there available. I really, yep, that would be my last, my last piece. Love that. I think, yeah, for me, the takeaway or the last piece of advice is it is a journey. It is a journey. It's a business journey. It's a life journey. And so have fun doing it. And all of your wildest dreams for your brand and your life can actually happen. And it can happen simultaneously. So this idea of I've got a goal, I want to do something with my brand, I want to do something in my life and embracing this journey is definitely available. And I think one of you know my favorite sayings probably just comes from being on and off the tube in London is just mind the gap. Mind the gap between where you're <laughs> at right now in your brand or in your life and where do you want to go? So what does that next step look like? And mind the gap and come up with what that next step is. And remember, it's just a journey and there is no misstep. It's just all opportunity and good stuff. I love that. Such a great thought to leave everybody with. And how can our listeners stay in touch with you and your company? What's the best way to get in touch? Absolutely. Uh, the best way is for sure buzzbeauty.com is our website, B-U-Z-Z-B-E-A-U-T-E.com. And then on Instagram, you can find us at buzzbeautyhive, and we're pretty active there. So DM us, we're available. And then LinkedIn as well, find us at buzzbeauty. We're available and would love to chat with anyone. And honestly, even if it's a quick question, we're there to help answer. Yes, I've learned never pass up an opportunity to just talk and discover uh, and work with people from the standpoint of everybody's got a story and spend time and learning it. So we would love to hear it. There is every opportunity to reach us out to us individually or through our website. And we just love uh, the beauty business and all the people involved with it. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jessica and Denise, for being here with us today. It was so amazing to hear your story, which is so unique and what you're offering to the industry. So thank you for being here. And thank you to everyone for listening. Check back next week for another great episode. And thank you so much, Abby, for being here with us as well. Great to meet both of you. And April, always fun to be here together. Thank you. I'm April Franzino, and this is Beauty Is Your Business. This has been Beauty Is Your Business, produced by Mouth Media Network, copyright 2021. Keep in touch on Instagram and Facebook at Mouth Media Network and find prior episodes at beautyisyourbusiness.com and wherever the best podcasts are found. Your brand message can be on this show. Email us to find out more at podcast at mouthmedianetwork.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.